Mr. Rosen, can we be optimistic when thinking about the world's energy and resource problems? Well, of course, that's a very general question, but I think basically the answer is no. If we want to be rational, we have to be fairly pessimistic these days because there has been so little change over the last several decades to uh, deal with both the energy problems the world faces and the climate problems that result from using energy. So I think we have to say no. Can research and development help to solve the world's climate problems cheaply? Well, research and development can always help to solve the world's climate problems through technology. But what people don't usually realize, and I get this question often from journalists, is that uh, energy technologies in particular have been under development for a very long time already, many for 100 to 150 years. So because the uh, chemistry and physics and engineering of energy um, use technologies as well as supply technologies are so well known to science, um, it's not likely we're going to get very quick improvements from research and development in energy technology. So yes, R&D can help, but it will be very slow and long time in coming. On the other hand, in my opinion, um, we don't need new technologies for quite a long time. We can do a lot to deal with our energy and climate issues with existing technology. In your opinion, to which extent can new clean energy technologies get even more efficient and help providing us with electricity that is at a fraction of the cost of car current coal-fired electricity? Well, let's not confuse efficiency and cost. Efficiency usually means energy efficiency, which has nothing to do with cost. In fact, usually if we make things more energy efficient, it costs more because it's, it's a different kind of technology and it's a technology that's more sophisticated in certain ways. And unless there's some fairly amazing breakthrough in technology, most new efficient technologies, particularly energy technologies, will be more expensive. And they'll certainly be m more expensive than coal-fired electricity is today, which is extremely cheap, much too cheap. So if people are looking for research and development to help us arrive at new, more efficient technologies, both supply and demand side, um, at a lower cost than coal, then they're very likely to be disappointed. The Talus Institute, of which you are one of the founding members and directors, has been performing energy and environmental policy analysis for over 30 years. What are the most urgent changes to achieve the great transition scenario? Okay, well, the great transition scenario, of course, is <coughs> a TELUS Institute uh, creation for a desirable future. Um, the, the great transition scenario differs from many other scenarios of the future, which mostly depend on just uh, technology improving, and energy technology in particular. So the great transition scenario includes improvements in energy technology and other technologies like agriculture, but it also includes changes in values and lifestyles and, and work ethic, um, such that uh, many aspects of life change simultaneously, because we don't think it's very likely that just through what w people often call tech fix, fixing technology and improving technology, that the world, world will be able to arrive at a desirable future state. So we think many other changes will be required in part to reduce people's uh, need for energy, need for consuming various products that require minerals and, and energy to create, and uh, people will have to live a bit more simply than the rich people in OECD countries currently do. Um, how could humans possibly, how could human values have to change and adjust for that. You mentioned already they will have to um, live on a lower level concerning energy consumption. What else? Well, for one thing, uh, as you know, many of the products that we buy today are made almost to be disposed of, t to be thrown away quickly after just a few years. In fact, I just read a figure that 
the average American uses their cell phone for only 22 months, less than two years, and they get a new one. Well, that, of course, is impossible to continue. You can't have uh, nine billion people in the world that may be here by the year 2050 doing that. Um, so one thing is for sure, we have to go back to the way things were even when I was a, a child and have products that last a long time and can be fixed. Um, when, when I was a child, everything was made of wood and metal. There was basically no plastic. So everything pretty much could be fixed if it broke because metal and wood can be fixed much more easily than plastic, for example. So we have to go back to a bit of a simpler time, which is not to say that people have to suffer. They can still have a house full of furniture. They can have a house, but it would have to be a smaller house than many Americans are certainly buying these days. It would have to be a much more energy efficient house. It would have to be a much more uh, materials efficient house. The furniture might have to be 50 years old, but you can have very nice furniture that's antique. So y you just have to keep things a lot longer and, and change the way you perceive in terms of human values the desirability of having older things that still function. Um, now there are other value changes too. For example, work. Um, as part of our great transition scenario, we trend the work week down from roughly 40, 45 hours a week currently to around 20 hours a week. So we're reducing work, which means that people are spending more of their time hopefully on things they value, like being with friends, family, playing music, doing other things that are not part of the formal economy. So they don't count as part of the work week formally. Um, and so one of the reasons why I think we'll need to have a shorter work week is because formal work tends to lead to more energy and materials use. So when you're in an office, you're using lights, electricity, heat, hot water, etc. Now you may do that at home too, but probably less. And of course there'd be less manufacturing going on if people only work 20 hours a week. So, um, and hopefully some of that time will be used to make recycling much more effective so that we need very little in, the n in, in terms of new mineral resources that have to be mined and pulled out of the ground. So there are many things that will have to change, but values clearly are one of them in terms of how we value spending our time and how we value um, consumption of products that we'll inevitably still buy, but hopefully a lot fewer of them any, in any given year. Um, how would the markets probably respond to this new setting? Well, when you talk about markets, of course, you, ha you have to be very careful because there's so much um, um, sort of talk about markets that's really very inaccurate to begin with. I mean, many people talk about free markets for almost everything and, of course, in fact, almost nothing is part of a free market. So <coughs> when I talk about markets in general, I try to distinguish what kind of market we're referring to. And every market is quite different from every other market. And there's also a time dimension to your question. So when you say, how will markets respond to these kinds of changes, there's a question in the short to medium term versus the long run. Now one of the problems with most markets or many markets today, which let's call them capitalist markets, um, many of the markets are very volatile and very dependent on growth. So if you don't have continuous growth of the economy in most parts of the world for many products or things that actually are transacted in markets, then markets get very, quote, nervous um, to put a human face on the markets and they often tend to lead to a lot of volatility in prices. And if you don't have growth, prices often sometimes fall a lot, certainly financial markets like stock markets. So one of the major challenges, in my opinion, to making a great transition to the future, making a transition to where we need to get, is how to manage markets of various types not to break down, 
not to collapse during a transition period. And this will be, I think, very tricky, very difficult, uh, especially when it comes to financial markets. I think so, too. So what do you think? Which policy reforms seem to be adequate for a sustainable civilization? Well, it's hard to say what would be adequate in the sense of sufficient, but I think we can identify some that are necessary to start with. Um, and one, of course, will be countries doing what Europe is starting to and what Germany is starting to, which is specify a severe limit on the amount of carbon emissions from that country in each year in the future until you get to zero carbon emissions. Uh, presumably for OECD countries, that kind of a policy would have to reach zero in about 50 years. <coughs> so that's certainly one policy that will affect many things. Now you'll need uh, many other sort of second level policies to enable the carbon emission policy to be realized and to come true. Um, so you'll have to have policies that subsidize solar energy. You'll have to have policies that subsidize more efficient technologies. You'll have to have policies that help low and middle income people to buy the things they need to help make the transition. Um, you'll have to have policies that encourage the redevelopment of organic agriculture. Right, 200 years ago, all agriculture was quote organic. Right, there were no <coughs> fertilizers that were used from artificial chemical uh, manufacturing facilities. There were no uh, pesticides used, et cetera. So we have to learn to go back to organic agriculture in a new way. Of course, one thing about organic agriculture is it's much more labor intensive typically. So that means the cost of food will have to be much higher than it is today to pay the workers an adequate wage to, to grow the food. And of course, most agricultural workers these days are not paid an adequate wage to begin with. So if you have both more workers and higher wages, food prices will really be higher. So you're going to have to have policies to deal with giving people an adequate income to afford the food that's grown more sustainably. So those are some examples. Similarly, we'll have to have much more control on land use, how land of different types and qualities can be used, whether for agriculture, whether for forests, whether for just protected uh, national parks or forests, or you'll have to have policies, of course, that limit <coughs> the uh, pollution of the oceans so that fisheries can revive. So sort of literally from soup to nuts in terms of food, depending on how that food arrives on our kitchen tables, we'll have to have policies to deal with all aspects of, of food, energy, land use, for example, and consumption of products, as I discussed uh, earlier. All right. Thanks a lot.